Hello everyone, my name is Pratyush Tiwari. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. Let me just move this to the side. So I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, jointly hosted in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, as well as the Institute for Physical Science of Technology. And uh, through this, I'm involved with the chemical physics and the biophysics uh, graduate programs. And today I will be telling you in these brief 10 minutes, I will be giving you a flavor for the kind of problems we look at in our group. So as you can see, we are interested in simulating proteins and crystals and trying to reach very, very long time scales. And let me tell you more about, uh, more about that. So let's see. So uh, as you will see in the following slides, my research in my group tends to be very interdisciplinary. So we have students from different departments. So far, we have three students from biophysics, one from physics, two from chemistry and one from applied math. And uh, this kind of reflects that the nature of the research carried out in our group. A bit of chemistry, a bit of physics, a bit of biophysics, computer science or math. You don't have to know everything, but you need to be good in one of them. And then you can pick up other things. It's, it's so, and, and, and we also have two very hardworking undergrads in the group. And we get our funding from a variety of sources. And uh, we use supercomputers wherever we can get hold of them. So one of the broad themes in my research is that we want to explore synergies between AI and statistical physics. So normally when this is a presentation in a room, I give this as a pop quiz and I invite you to do the same at the moment. So this is a chapter from a book with the title Confronting the Partition Function. And I would like you to think for a moment whether this chapter is coming from a book on deep learning by Ian Goodfellow or a book on statistical mechanics by Mark Tuckerman. So I'm gonna give you just five seconds as you make your mind. All right? Okay, five seconds over. So when I do this in a room, typically people's response is, more people tend to lean towards statistical mechanics for this because you have partition function. If you look more carefully, you will even see things such as Jarzinski's relation, but actually it's from the deep learning book. And so the reason in showing this slide is that both the fields of deep learning and statistical mechanics kind of have similar problems involving things such as partition function and other things. And uh, we are trying to develop methods where ideas from deep learning are used in statistical physics and vice versa to solve very practical problems. The type of problems we would like to solve are such as how do drugs dissociate from proteins? This is a drug called Glivec, which made it to the cover of Time magazine in 2001. Only 13 years later, the same drug made it to the cover of Newsweek with the title Getting Cancer Wrong. So when it came in 2001, it was a wonder drug. People who would get certain forms of leukemia uh, would, their mortality rate just improved by tenfolds or something like that. But 13 years later, these people were again getting cancer. And a big part of this is that this is evolution in its basic form. Here you take the drug which goes and blocks a specific protein a few years later, the protein starts to develop mutation, which makes the drug ineffective. And this is 2020, in the context of coronavirus, we have similar fears that you don't have a protein, you have uh, basically an RNA, and the RNA is evolving. Even if you design a drug that goes and binds it, what if the RNA changes into something else, and the drug starts being infected? So just looking at the crystal structure of this protein, or RNA, or whatever it is, it would be very hard to predict which mutations in the host would make a given drug ineffective. What we would like to do is to do all atom simulations, which is molecular dynamic simulations, where we preserve the identity of every atom and just let the protein evolve. Let the protein study it as a function of time with femtosecond and all atom resolution and really try to get a grasp of what's going on. So, and, uh, our, we are interested not just in problems in bio, uh, bi biophysics, we are also interested in problems in chemical physics and material science. For example, if you have a bunch of atoms on the surface of a thin film, at some point they will course in together and form one uniform uh, structure. How much time does that take? What is the process for this to happen? As you can see, these things happen slower than milliseconds. Similarly, you could have a nanopillar and you're trying to compress the nanopillar slowly at some point, so this is a face-centered cubic structure, at some point dislocations will form and the dislocations will start to move. And now you can see the pillar is deforming. We would like to study these. These are things which can be done in experiment, but in experiment, you cannot get the resolution of the type I'm showing you here, or I showed you for the protein. In molecular dynamic simulations, you can get such a resolution. 
and study these things. So I have been saying molecular dynamic simulations for those of you who don't know what they are, it's essentially as simple as solving Newton's law of motion. What you take as input is a force field or a potential that governs the interaction between atoms. And then you evolve Newton's law of motion as a function of time. This is Newton as per Google images. And you evolve Newton's law of motion as a function of time. And we have to do this on a supercomputer because there are so many atoms that we need to solve the equations of motion for. And once you keep doing it again and again and again, you can get all sorts of emergent dynamics at different length and time scales, going all the way from femtosecond to longer and uh, length scales atomic to even micron level. However, there's a huge problem when you're solving Newton's law of motion, you have a differential equation with a time step of femtosecond. On supercomputers such as Deep Thought at University of Maryland, which is really fancy supercomputer, you can get up to a microsecond if you do it maybe for a couple of weeks. That's still very slow. Not, not a lot of interesting physics happens at microseconds. Now, something happened over the years. People realized that hardware, which was being developed to keep undergrads from getting bored, such as Call of Duty, you know, one of the reasons this these video games were and are so successful is because the graphic is so engaging, right? The blood is simply so real. And the reason the graphics so engaging, part of it is due to the use of graphical processing units, GPUs. So people realized that GPUs could be put to better use by using them in MD simulations, and that also pushed the boundary. And there have been more advances. A very rich person in Wall Street got involved in the problem. He designed a very special computer called Anton. The total amount of money that has been put into Anton amounts to maybe a billion dollars, if not more. And with this, people were able to get to a millisecond. But that's kind of it with raw hard, hardware uh, developments. So maybe you can study conformational changes in proteins with things like this, but to study how does a crystal nucleate or how does a drug unbind from a protein, the time scales are still prohibitively slow. And we just don't want to study the fastest event, we want to study the full spectrum. And of course, with, with time, we will have more and more complicated force fields. We will not just be doing this is all for classical simulations. At some point, we would like to do fully quantum simulations and there the time scale problem will be even more brutal. So, and the reason why this problem is theoretically so hard is because unlike dealing with larger systems we can, where you can just use bigger and bigger supercomputers, for the time scale problem, you are stuck with the problem that time is inherently sequential. You cannot just take I cannot recruit 100 graduate students and say, well, you look at t is equal to one, you look at t is equal to two, and we will take this all and make a, uh, make a soup out of it and get very, very long time scales. That's not going to happen. In order to predict the future, you need to know the, period. You need to know the past exactly. That's, now we are really at the core of the research in my group, which is how much of the past do you need to know exactly in order to predict the future? And this is what we call as the reaction coordinate in physical chemistry, uh, I really don't have time to go into this in detail in 10 minutes, and I am hoping some of you will write me emails or set up personal Skype so I can talk about this if you're interested in this. But essentially, a reaction coordinate captures all the relevant slow degrees of freedom. Everything else that is not captured in this low dimensional mode is irrelevant. It is just white noise. So the tricks people do is, first of all, we have to see what happens in molecular dynamics. If you have a two-state picture, just a simple toy model, you would be stuck in one basin and an event that takes you to the other side would be a rare event. It would be, you can see there are thermal fluctuations going on here in the left basin and a thermal fluctuation big enough to take you to the other side can happen, but you just have to wait for a very, very long time. Now there are approaches such as metadynamics. These are called enhanced sampling approaches. If you, uh, in statistics, they are more generally called important sampling. So the idea here is that Wherever you go in this landscape, you add a little bit of repulsive bias. So imagine that uh, you have lots of wells in, in, in a, like in a football field, you have in a field, you have lots of, lots of wells and you go and fall into one well and you're just trying to jump and you're probably going to find it very hard to jump out of the well. But if you had at your disposal, something called essentially sand, in this case, it's computational sand. You have infinite computational sand at your disposal. And wherever you go in the well, you add a little bit of sand. So at some point, the well will start to fill up and you will, more be, you will be more likely to escape into the other well and so and so back and forth. So metadynamics is a hugely popular method. You can go and check it's something like 5,000 citations and it's 10 years or 20 years of existence. However, there is a big problem. It allows you to explore back and forth. It also allows, there is a method that I developed when I was a postdoc in ETH Zurich in Switzerland, which allows you to get true kinetics out of this metadynamics protocol 
All of this is wonderful, but it works only if you have a sense of this true reaction coordinate. And that's a chicken versus egg problem. In order to perform such enhanced sampling, you need to know the reaction coordinate. You need to know the slow degrees of freedom. How do you know the slow degree of freedom when you're looking at a new system that you haven't sampled to begin with? So for this, we would like to develop methods that kind of learn this reaction coordinate on the fly as to sample rare event systems. For this, we have at least two methods. One of them I developed when I was up in my, during my second postdoc at Columbia University, which uses ideas from statistical mechanics called maximum caliber or path entropy. This method is called SCOOP. It's, it was first published in TNAs. You can go and look up these references. And uh, it led up to many follow-up methods, such as this meta tika and tika meta by competing groups. I'm not gonna go into that SCOOP method so much. I want, in the remaining two minutes, I want to just give you a flavor of the methods that we have been primarily developing since starting at Maryland. These methods use form of deep learning and they essentially go back to the slide that I showed you in the very beginning regarding making synergistic use of artificial intelligence and statistical physics. So the notion here, and the method is called RAVE, re-rated auto-encoded variation base for enhanced sampling. It possibly reflects, the name reflects on the fact that when I was a first year professor here around two years ago, and uh, I was listening to a lot of techno music as I was coding things myself. So I think that's where subconsciously the title RAVE came from. It's also easy to remember. And uh, this was the first RAVE paper in 2018. Over the uh, last two years, we have published two more papers and two more are currently uh, about to be submitted. So the RAVE takes its inspiration from deep learning where you, know, you, have, you have these websites where you can upload pictures. So my cousins back home in India like to play this game where they upload a picture like their picture and the picture of some girl or some guy that they fancy. And they ask the question, well, if we got married, how would our baby look like, right? So what's a picture to a computer? It's just a set of numbers, you know, RGB values over maybe a 28 by 28 matrix, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2 everywhere. So if you took the arithmetic mean of these two pictures, it's not going to look like a baby. It's going to look like a, maybe a potato or an onion, I don't know. So in order to do something like this, where you're actually mixing facial features, Deep learning has been very powerful. What it does is to put notions of human intuition into practice. For example, as a human, you can mix facial features and kind of think about things. You will think like, oh, maybe the nose should be kind of in the middle of these two people's noses. Maybe this one has more hair, this one has less hair, something like that. So that's what you're doing here. You have an input layer comprising this very high dimensional space. You pass it through a set of neurons, which are just activation functions and you get to some load emission mapping, which looks something like this. It could be 1D, 2D, 3D, whatever. And you do your averaging, not in the state of input features, but you do your averaging in the state of these abstract variables. Over here, I'm showing you something called variation autoencoder. There are other forms of deep learning also, which do similar things. So our inspiration was quite simple. Could we use this load emission variable learned from deep learning as a reaction coordinate in chemistry and physics? And uh, there were other people who tried to do this over the past year. You can see the first work was actually in 2005 and it kind of failed. And there is a story why it failed and then it, these things had a revival in 2018. So of course there are lots of practical problems in doing this. And I'm not going to tell you how do we actually solve these practical problems. Some of them are still in process and that's where there is opening for students such as yourselves to come and help me solve these problems. But the number one that I would like to show here is the, regarding the perils of deep learning. So like currently in 2020, you can think of COVID and you would see articles almost every hour, there is a new article, if not more than every hour. Using AI, we have found a new drug. Most of them are crap. And the reason they are crap is, and I will try to show you why that happens. Because, so this is a website at Stanford where you upload a picture. And once you upload the picture, the computer generates a text for the picture. Here it says, man in black shirt is playing guitar. Young girl in pink shirt is swinging on swing. So when it works well, it works beautifully. Sometimes it doesn't work well. And then you get things such as picture and the text generated by computer, punch of bananas on the table. Picture, text generated by computer, group of people standing around the house, and so on and so forth. So human intuition is very easy in saying, well, that's a wrong solution. That's clearly not correct. But having in an automatic procedure, being able to tell that this is a wrong solution, the right solution is extremely complicated. So this is one of the challenges we are trying to solve. There are some other challenges. For example, how do we learn models that are physically interpretable? So to do, to do all this, 
and I'm really running out of time now, I was told 10 minutes, I'm already at 13. What we do is to use the notion of an information bottleneck. And I really refer you to this paper that we published in Nature Communication, where it puts this deep learning business in practice and uses the notion that it's, it's a very intuitive concept that a good model of a system should have two properties. First of all, it should compress the system as much as possible while it should be able to predict as much as possible, right? So you want to, it to look like a bottleneck. On the left side, you want as little information as needed. Everything else is noise. So this model is easy to compute. Furthermore, it is still predictive of whatever you're trying to do. So you have a bottleneck structure. You can express this bottleneck as, and we will get to that in a moment. So the way we do that in my group is to think of it as the input being as the current state of a system and the output being as the future state of a system. And just like a frog trying to catch a fly, this delta T must be positive because if you're coming up with a model, if you're a frog which is trying to catch a fly and you're fixated on where the fly is at this very moment, you will be a hungry frog, right? You want to make predictions about the future of the fly slightly into the future. And uh, so this information bottleneck framework has been applied to actually for problems such as this. How do, how does retinal processing work and things like that. And we want to apply it to biophysics. And for this, in order to math mathematically write this down, we have a ratio, we have a difference of two mutual informations. And uh, in this paper or in the nature communication paper, we show actually all the business that goes on here in solving this. I just wanna show you some brief applications of all of this. We can now study, for example, how does this small ligand dissociate from a protein? What is the pathway it takes? We can reach time scales. This is the rate. So the resonance time is one over the rate. We can reach time scales, which are way beyond current all atom MD simulations in good agreement with experiments and as well as other methods, other competing methods. It's an important problem. So of course, we are not the only people trying to develop methods. Others are also trying. And then we can make predictions about which mutations in the protein would make this ligand or drug ineffective. And some of these predictions are actually very interesting. They probably reflect, reflected something called allosteric communication. And we can apply it to more and more complicated drugs and uh, get time scales which are in good agreement with experiments qualitatively and quantitatively. And uh, there are other problems that also we are trying to solve here. Eventually, what we are trying to do is to really make all of this fully automated. So we have some atoms. This could be a biological system. This could be a crystal or some thin film or a nanomaterial or a quantum dot, we have some atoms. Given the position of the atoms in a force field, we construct a reaction coordinate automatically. Given this reaction coordinate, we perform simulations where we get back and forth movement between different states. We get free energy with kinetics and all of this is completely automated. And that's kind of the big theme of my research group. With that, thank you very much. And, uh, you can find me on Twitter. So let's go back to the first page, which has my contact information. So you, we have our lab group is on Twitter. You can find all the information out of that, Tiwari Lab. You can also go to our website and find my information. And my email is first initial, second name, P Tiwari at the rate umd.edu. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.